Inside this video right here, I'm gonna give you the information you need to know about PALS before you enter PALS class. Let's dive into it. I want to help decrease failure rates for NREMT, for EMT school, for paramedic school. Watch these videos, watch this content, and believe me, you will start to understand EMS medicine. Anybody out there that wants to serve their community as an EMT or a paramedic should be able to do that. And I'm here as a paramedic coach to help you achieve that. Hey everyone, it's Paramedic Coach back here with another video. Make sure you hit like and subscribe down below, hit the notification bell so you can join the Paramedic Coach Army and see all our videos. Inside this video right here, we're gonna be talking about PALS, okay? I have a full chart here, okay? And we're gonna be talking about different things inside of PALS, but we gotta start with the most important thing. Inside of PALS, this is one of the hallmarks, again, that makes a paramedic a paramedic. We talk about cardiology and pharmacology. PALS is essentially cardiology and pharmacology, advanced life support for pediatric patients. The first thing you need to know is children get in trouble so often because of breathing problems, because of respiratory problems. Could be croup, could be anaphylaxis, could be asthma, right? Now, I'm gonna start by saying this. If you look at my chart here, respiratory arrest, most common cause of arrest in children. One of the most common causes, if not the most common cause of arrest in children is because of a breathing issue, a respiratory issue, okay? Now that we know that, we need to know the difference between mild respiratory distress, severe respiratory distress, respiratory failure, and respiratory arrest. This is a flow chart. Let's talk about a patient in asthma, a pediatric patient having an asthma attack. If they start off in respiratory distress, these are some of the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. This is, this is the first sign you're gonna see. You're gonna see the rate of breathing. So the breathing effort and the respiratory rate is gonna increase. You can see stuff such as nasal flaring, Okay, retractions, accessory muscle use. So, using muscles on the tear on the chest wall. Okay. Now let's talk about respiratory distress, respiratory failure, and then respiratory arrest, which will then lead into cardiac arrest, okay? Now, the patient will start off, let's say they're having an asthma attack. They'll start off with mild respiratory distress, and if we don't do anything, they'll work their way down, to moderate, to severe, okay? And then eventually, they're gonna cross the line here. See this line I have here? This is a line that we don't wanna cross. Once a child gets in a respiratory failure, there's usually some bad outcomes. We need to act up here before they cross the line from severe distress to respiratory failure. Once they're in failure, the outcome's not good, okay? And now, uh, once they're in failure, if we do nothing, they'll end up in respiratory arrest. A child that gets in a respiratory arrest, again, outcomes aren't good, okay? They go to cardiac arrest. We don't want them to cross this line. So we, why do I say this? The reason I say this is we need to act aggressive with children. We need to act confidently when managing children. We don't want to be waiting. We need to be taking action so they don't cross this line. Okay. Let's talk about a quick difference between mild and severe distress. So the fear, severe distress is trending to going over the line if we don't do something. Mild, okay, they're early. Good, let's treat them and get the ball rolling. Okay, and here we go. Let's say sometimes an asthma attack again. Mild distress would be You'll see an increased respiratory effort, but only mild. So maybe their breathing rate is just a little above normal, okay? Their skin color is still good, okay? Skin looks good, and their GCS is 15, okay? Now someone with severe, on the other hand, on the, we're, we're going from mild, whoop, now we're in severe land. Here we go. Now they're gonna have severe increased 
rate of breathing, severe work of breathing. They're going to have poor skin color, okay? All right? They're going to be trending toward the really bad sign we're going to talk about later. And then alter mental status, okay? They're not going to be GC15, they're going to be confused, okay? Alter mental. Now, what are some other signs and symptoms of more severe distress or a sign of respiratory distress? Here they are. First thing you're going to see is that increased work of breathing, an increased effort to breathe, okay? Now, in respiratory distress, think about the child. Of still, they're still trying, they're still awake, they're still alert, and they're trying to save themselves, okay? In failure, they're failing. They are not compensating anymore. They're not, they're not fighting anymore. They're letting their body fail, okay? The stress is like, all right, there's something bad going on, I'm gonna fight it. Failure is, I'm throwing in the towel, I can't take it anymore, okay? Now, nasal flaring, okay? The nose starts flaring. Retractions and accessory muscle use. So that's do what you'll notice. Look at the look at you gotta expose the patient's chest. So you want to expose any pediatric patient you want to expose their chest. Every single, I'll say it again, every single child that you see, you want to expose their chest. So when you do your think about it, when you're listening to the lungs, you want to pop their shirt up and you want to ex do an exam, okay? Because you want to see. One of these big signs, accessory muscle use, okay? So again, you need to expose your patient. Next is gonna be abnormal sounds. Well, obviously, if we have strider, if we have a, a severe barking cough, right? If we have wheezing, right? These are abnormal sounds. It's a sign that we're in distress, okay? Remember that change in mental status. We go from mild to severe when we get confusion, okay? Pale or cool skin, that's your poor skin, okay? Now, what's going to be the difference between distress and failure? Again, think about it. If you're in distress, you're still putting up a fight. If you're in failure, you're thrown in the towel, okay? So failure means you're about to go into a rest, okay? So look, respiratory failure now, instead of fighting with an increased respiratory rate, we're going to have a failure, so we're gonna have a decreased respiratory rate and work of breathing, okay? Talk about this here, okay? This is a late sign, it means they're about to go to rest, okay? And what about an irregular breathing pattern? So you're not breathing regularly, they're breathing irregularly. That could be a sign, okay? What else? Little or no effort or little or no air movement, okay? Remember that? Well, remember, if you look at the child, look, at, look into their eyes, you have to look at the whole picture, the whole appearance. When you look at the pediatric patient, okay? When you're looking at that pediatric patient, you want to get that appearance, that impression. When you look at them, does it look like they're fighting to breathe and they're looking around and they're, and they're looking at you and they see what's going on? Or are they lost, they're in their own world, and they're just, just looking down at the floor and they don't even know you're there. That's another sign of, of failure. Again, poor, and poor ventilation, and then here's your skin. We go from pale and cool to now we get a sign of cyanosis. Blue skin. Okay, that ain't good. Okay, nails, lips, okay. Now, if we do nothing, or we're too late, respiratory arrest, which is the most common cause of arrest in children. Okay, now that we know this, let's go through our cardiac arrest algorithm for PALS, okay? This is some of the most important information you need for PALS. This alone will help you out tremendously in PALS. Now let's talk about the cardiac arrest algorithm for PALS. You ready? So let's now talk about the pediatric PALS uh, cardiac arrest algorithm, okay? 
Now remember your BLS. I have a video on this channel that talks about the BLS CPR, but I want to give you some pearls about that, that BLS real quick. So CPR, remember that two rescuer pediatric CPR, the BLS, is 15-2. One rescuer is 30-2. That's your BLS. Remember, do not hyperventilate the patient. One breath every three to five seconds. Now, remember your cycles of CPR are every two minutes and you want to switch compressors, okay? Now, the other thing we're going to look at here is going to be starting CPR. Okay, well, that's the first thing we do. So, kids in cardiac arrest, okay, start your compression, start CPR, and attach your cardiac monitor, get your pads, okay? Now, here comes the algorithm, okay? We're going to talk about some, some other stuff later. We are now a paramedic. We don't need the AED anymore to tell us if it's VT or VF or a systole or PA, we can do it ourselves because we've been trained in cardiology. So what this means is we look here, we're going to say is the patient in VT or VF, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, or is the patient in a systole or PEA? Remembering, VT and VFib, basically the heart is just quivering. Asystole, there's no electrical activity at all. PEA is pulseless electrical activity. So it's not a shockable rhythm like this. Okay, we can't defib it. These are the only two rhythms that we defib with no pulse. Okay. PEA, there's no nothing. It could be anything that's not this, it's pulseless electrical activity. Okay? Now, let's start with the shock. The shock, the first shock is two joules per kilogram, okay? Your next or subsequent shocks, if needed, are four joules per kilogram. So, let's think about our order of operations. Start CPR, attach the patch, put the heart monitor on the patient, okay? What are we gonna do next? Okay. So let's, so let's just go through our order of operations. Pediatric and cardiac arrest. Okay. Start CPR. Okay. Place, place the pads in the patient. Okay. Attach your cardiac monitor. Okay. Shockable or not. VTVF, shock. Asystole PEA, no shock. Got it. Okay. What do we do now? If there's no shock, we go right into our IVIO access and we give epi every three to five minutes at a dose of 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. And then we're going to think H and T's. Okay? We're going to talk about that. Now, the next thing here is going to be yes, VTVF. Shock. First shock is 2 joules per kilogram. Following shocks, or if we need more shocks and if we don't convert it, 4 joules per kilogram. Okay? Then we go down the algorithm. IVAO access. We would have our epi, 0.01 milligrams per kilogram every three to five minutes. If the patient continues later on down algorithm, we're going to have amiodarone. Amiodarone pH is five milligrams per kilogram. Okay? You got to know these drugs. If someone was to be in persistent, let's say they were in persistent V fit, you would start CPR, attach the pads. Oh, they're in V fit. You would shock. 2 joules per kilogram. Continue your CPR cycles. Okay, remember, continuous cycles. Okay, we, we, we got that. Continuous cycles, CPR, okay? Now what are we gonna do? IVAO access. Continue your cycle. Hey, we're at, we're, we're, hey, we're at a rhythm check. Okay, what do we got? Still be fit. Okay, shock 4 joules per kilogram. Okay, okay, here we go. Now, continue your CPR. Okay, okay, now what do we do? Epi, 0, 0.0, 0 point. Now, okay, now we're gonna get epi, 0. 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Okay, now what we're gonna do? Okay, cycle CPR, rhythm check. Okay, what do we do now? Uh, okay, now we're gonna give, uh, let's see, a shock. Okay, so we give a shock, uh, four joules per kilogram. Okay, great, continue on. Okay, now we're in the next two minute cycle. What are we gonna do? Amiodarone. Uh, what are we gonna do? Uh, five milligrams per kilogram. Okay, and then you're gonna go. Do another cycle and then go back, you shock again at four joules per kilogram, you give an epi, then you go back again, you're a second dose of amio. Now at that point, you've been a code for a while. Now I understand the H and T's, they say it's over here. I also want to put it here. If you're in a code for 15, 20 minutes and you haven't gotten ROSC, 
it's time to start thinking about H's and T's. So we're back here, we're talking about H's and T's. These are the reversible causes that you're gonna go over if you're at a cardiac arrest and it's been a little while. Let's talk about it. So here's how I remember them. H's, T's, start with H, starts with T. We think who is friends. Now, why is this? Hypoxia, hypovolemia are the first two H's. They go together because by the time you get to this point, you're already gonna be doing hypoxia and hypovolemia. You're gonna be treating that. You're gonna have advanced airway. You're probably have an IV bag home. Now, next is hydrogen ion acidosis and hypo or hyperkalemia. Well, part of hyperkalemia treatment is sodium bicarb. Hydrogen ion acidosis treatment is sodium bicarb. So think about them as friends, they get treated the same way. Hypothermia is an island by itself. Think cold and alone. Okay, hypothermia. Now what about, hey, what about hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia? That's an H. Well, it's not an H. Not it used to be, not anymore. So in real life, hey, if you want to get a blood sugar at this point, go for it, okay? But this is not going to be on your test, so we're going to get, get rid of it, okay? T. Now T, the T's are listed as tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, thrombosis, and toxins. Those are going to be what the T's are. Now here's why I break it up, okay? Trauma, think, so first think trauma, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. Great, then toxins. Nobody wants a toxin, so it stays by itself. Next is thrombosis. Well, that's broken up into pulmonary embolism and MI. So if you remember these friend groups, you'll remember it, you can spit it out. What's gonna happen at PALS is you're gonna be doing the mega code, and they're literally gonna say, hey, what are your H and T's? Ready, set, go. And you gotta spit them off rapid. Hey, before I go, I wanna show you this graphic about PALS. So here's cardiac arrest in children. So these are the three types of pathways. Think about it. Respiratory, shock, and sudden. So remember, what are the main causes of cardiac arrest in children? Respiratory. So respiratory failure. Could be upper airway, croup gets real bad. Lower airway, asthma gets real bad, okay? Could lead to cardiac arrest. Shock gives you hypotension. Hypovolemic, dehydration, hemorrhage. Distributive shock sepsis, neurogenic, anaphylactic. These are the most common causes. Sudden, SIDS, trauma, drowning in children, and arrhythmia, all leading to cardiac arrest. If we see these, we gotta catch them early. Think respiratory acute, think dehydration illness, think sudden issue, life-changing event can lead here. We gotta saw them before they get here, and that is PALS. Now, if you really enjoyed this video on PALS and you're looking for more, maybe you've watched videos on YouTube, you've seen me on TikTok, you've seen me online, Facebook, Instagram, but you're looking for more content, you want my video vaults, you're looking for the best content I can share with you, the best tips and tricks I can give you being a paramedic, being an EMT, being an advanced EMT. What I'm gonna have you do is click on the link in the description down below. You can get instant lifetime access to my video vault and get access to me as your paramedic coach. Also inside the video vault, you can ask me questions inside our private community group while you're studying. Click the link in the description down below and do sign up before the coming price increase. I will see you soon and everybody stay safe and take care. What particular program you have your students engaging and you have your students discussing and you have your students actually using your products and i'm seeing time and time again um students that are coming in and announcing their new certification with national registry it's obviously passing the exam doing it pretty quickly 70 questions in about an hour um well you definitely are like how your videos are like i wasn't sure how it was gonna be, but you are how you, your videos are. So that was awesome. So people who are getting ready for paramedic school, or if you're getting ready to go in the Navy as a corpsman or as an army medic, um, you gotta prepare yourself. Evan, I know you got a program that helps people prepare that way. So bottom line is guys, you don't ever wanna hear something for the first time with a bunch of other students. So if you're in a competitive learning environment, you don't wanna hear about AFib for the first time where everybody else, you wanna have an understanding of it before you walk in the room. From 120 questions, passing two sections, um, near passing one, and then I think 
two below passing, two seven questions passing completely. 